<laughs> yeah, he, he, yeah. he was he was pretty tough. He was pretty tough, man. But I love that because it means that uh, when you know whenever you're training your guys like to become good closers on your own team, it definitely means that you're you're giving them the right the, the right feedback. And, Absolutely, and, their, and everything. So that is great. Um, having trouble with Facebook might be an issue in, in, in its end. Like always, Facebook is trying to screw something up. I uh, know. Let me see. Let me see something. <laughs> oh, Facebook just sent me a. Someone ha may have tried to access your account. Yes, it was me. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me just go here uh, real quick. Oh, I forgot to turn off my VPN. That's why. I was in Canada. I was trying to do some stuff in Canada, recruit some guys in Canada. Nice. Uh, but uh, yeah, so not, that's why it uh, it actually got me. But I think we're live in YouTube, uh, in the private YouTube listing. But man, it's so nice having you here. Um, I like to really just uh, tell everyone that they're they're gonna have first tips on on this. Um, Whatever it is that we talk, it's going to be released in the podcast. Um, okay. And I would love to really touch base on, on, on closing. I like to touch base on, of course, getting to know you and the closers and the things that you did in Closers Olympics. Uh, I think that will be huge for people to, uh, to really get a, you know, get a sense of how important and how good the, watching these type of things is for them and for their team. Absolutely. So, and learning from people like you. So, I'm going to go here, man, and uh, I'm going to uh, turn on uh, the intro of the, um, of the podcast, and we're going to go live. Sounds good? Sounds good. Awesome. Let's go. Mic check. I'm good. Mic check. Mic check. You can read about success all day long, but if you don't put in the work, the mindset, execution, and the hustle behind your vision, it just remains a dream. When everything goes wrong, you have to take all the responsibility. We uncover what high-level entrepreneurs, business owners do to rise up from hustling daily. So do what you feel passionate about. Take chances. The world becomes your library to help you to become better at your craft. Join me as I share with you actionable tips to help you grow your business, learn skills, and help you level up in your self-development journey. Your number one spot for business and personal growth is the Online Hustlers Podcast with your host, Esteban Andrade. All right, guys, what is going on? We have here the Online Hustlers Podcast. We have... RJ Bates the third, and uh, as you all know, this this series, these episodes are going to be all about REI marketing and conversion, everything that you need for your real estate investing and wholesaling business to to kind of level up, to to go to different levels uh, by bringing in diamond top players. And today, I'm excited for this guest. Why? Because this guest not only has done great things, and if you've been following him at some point on social media, Facebook, Instagram, whatever it is that you've seen, RJ the uh, Bates the third is because he's done um, this 30 day journey where, he, where, well, he went to 30 different states and he actually called and got contracts and, and, and went out outside of his way because I'm pro probably he, he had to also, you know, spend time with his girl, with his family, but he decided to really just go at it. Mm -hmm. And yep. decided to just show you and add value. Uh, RJ, man, I'm so excited to have you here in the Online Hustlers podcast. Uh, how are you, man? How's everything going with after post uh, Closers Olympics? How did that go, man? Man, uh, I'm excited to be here. That that intro is fire, bro. That that was uh, that's a cool little intro to get me fired up there. Uh, Closers Olympics, post Closers Olympics has been pretty crazy. Um, I don't think I've ever had more. Instagram messages, Facebook messages, calls, text messages. I mean, literally from across the world. I I don't think we really understood the reach that the Closers Olympics had um, and, until after I won. Uh, I did a podcast yesterday for a, a virtual wholesaling group in Israel. 
Um, I got uh, reached out to by a couple of VAs that said there was a, a watch party for the Closers Olympics over in the Philippines of 30 oh, wow. virtual assistants watching. Um, so, yeah, man, it, it's been a crazy ride. And, and uh, I, I guess this is about as close as you can get to being famous. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, it's, uh, it's been a fun ride. That's awesome, man, because, uh, well, a lot of people actually don't know uh, Closers Olympics just yet. Yep. It's starting to pick up a lot of momentum and uh, yep. starting to get a lot of credibility. But Closers Olympics is basically um, the top notch uh, type of real estate entrepreneurs, investing entrepreneurs and wholesalers in the country. They meet up, they gather up uh, these judges and they also gather up these contestants. So let's let's see a picture of gladiators, picture of Vikings going into the, the arena or just a UFC fight. And Mr. RJ Bates, he is uh, Conor McGregor here. <laughs> he is the <laughs> Conor McGregor. And you put them in inside of this arena and you start dialing uh, to motivated sellers so that we can, of course, help them get outside of the situation, but get properties under contract. Yep. And, and, and in this specific 2021 Closers Olympics, which RJ Bates the third won, he actually, um, he actually won by the majority of the points. He actually also uh, was uh, beating every single one from the Slayer judge that we had an episode two as well from that one, uh, Steve Trang. And um, he got the majority of the points of this. And that by the end of the round, like they couldn't even handle it anymore. They said uh, stoppage by technical KO, yeah. and and it was it was fun. Like if you're a real estate investor and wholesaler, you need to absolutely get that replay and watch RJ Bates uh, the third because is you're gonna use it for your team. You're gonna use it for yourself, and you're gonna know the level of skill sets that it requires to actually acquire properties all over the USA. But yep. talk to me, RJ. Give me a little bit of a background. Tell me all about yourself. I'd love to know about you because I, you know, we, we just discussed and we just talked uh, here and there on Facebook. But I really want, want right. to find out more about you and then all that progression from being a hustler all the way to you being the closer of the closer of the Olympics. Yeah. So uh, I've been an entrepreneur for a little bit over a decade now. Uh, it, it, we didn't start in real estate investing, we actually started a business that was, uh, helping general contractors supplement their insurance claims. So specifically roofers that were, you know, going out and doing insurance work, say the, the insurance company said, Hey, we'll give you $10,000. We were supplementing that, finding all the items that the insurance company missed, boosting that claim up and taking a percent of the, the funds that we got for them. And, and that led to, Hey, my, my employees, they didn't really know how to talk to insurance adjusters like they were a contractor or a roofer. So as an entrepreneur, what did I do? I said, let's go sell some roofs. I did this when I was 18. I know, I know how to do this. And so we became a general contractor at that point in time. And, and then uh, eventually got hired by real estate investors um, saying, hey, why don't you go take a look at this house? Tell me what your bid would be to, to, to rehab it for me. And uh, that led to me finding out about wholesaling. And, and I was miserable as a contractor. It was just not ah. fun for me. It didn't resonate with my, my mindset. And, uh, but I, I saw wholesaling and I'm like, this is just a middleman that's basically pushing paper right here. Uh, this seems like something that I could do really well. And, and so that was about 2014. Um, January 1 of 2015, we shut down the general contract to business, went full time in the, to wholesaling. And uh, the, the 2015, that first year, we did about 750,000 in assignment fees. Um, and that, that was pretty much the turning point. It was like, hey, no looking back at that point. Um, we pretty quickly went into virtual wholesaling. We went into markets like San Antonio and Austin. I'm based out of Dallas, Fort Worth. So we went into San Antonio, Austin, Portland, Oregon, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, started doing deals in, in those virtual locations. And we realized hey, when we're going to these virtual locations, we're actually able to get deals at a better spread than what we were getting here at Dallas-Fort Worth. So it, it resonated with us pretty quickly. And uh, that led to eventually we started flipping houses. We took down rentals. At, at different points in time, we've owned uh, 100 plus rental properties. We've had 50 plus rehabs going on at a time. Not all of that was good. 
some of it was bad and and we had a ton of growing pains but we learned through that and uh now at this point in time I, we have our headshot concept which is nationwide virtual wholesaler um where you know i'm i'm really good on the aspect of of marketing um i I've, I've kind of developed systems and processes around that that allow us to be uh, pretty, pretty good at, at acquiring properties and disposing properties. And so that's what's resonated with us out of everything that we've done in real estate investing. As far as single family real estate goes, we've pretty much done anything that you can do. Um, and that's where we've kind of laid our eggs and said, hey, this is where we're best, which is virtual wholesaling. Wow, that's amazing. So uh, for the listeners here, some of them are experienced, highly experienced investors, but a lot of them, they're maybe just starting out or they've been in the game for some time, kind of like scared of taking some chances, some some risks here and there. And you mentioned that you do virtual wholesaling. A lot of people yeah. are truly not even comfortable about the whole concept of going outside of an area they're, they're, they don't know about. Uh, just they're, they don't want to go up above that backyard type of uh, right. type of thing. So what really made you uh, go outside and, and how did you even handle going outside of your even areas? What, what makes you so, so good at doing that right now? Well, I, I think first and foremost, being in a market like Dallas Fort Worth, which is one of the most competitive markets to be in, um, that will make you look outside the box on, Hey, what is going to allow us to go get the type of volume and the revenue that we really want, right? Um, instead of beating my head against the wall and saying, hey, I have to do this right here in my backyard, I don't. Um, there's nothing that, that forces us to do that. And, and when we decided to go into other markets, specifically Northeast, Midwest, and the Sun Belt areas, those are kind of that little horseshoe shape right there is, is kind of our, our niche area. Um, we were able to find that, hey, there's there's really mo highly motivated sellers there, right? And so the struggles that you have to overcome is boots on the ground and and finding buyers and how are you going to handle showings? And, and that really just comes down to processes, right? Understanding uh, everybody needs to understand the role and how we handle those situations. And, and I get the questions all the time, right? Like, how do you handle boots on the ground in Indianapolis, Indiana? Well, we, we go and we hire a photographer for 50 bucks. Um, that's, that's as simple as there. There you go. You got your pictures. You got your recon done on the property. Um, and then as far as finding buyers, there's, you know, utilizing social media um, and, and cold calling with virtual assistants um, with purchasing uh, cash buyers list for PropStream and Propelio and Batch Leads. Look, these are, these are the ways that we solve those problems. And it's just an everyday occurrence that makes us a little bit better. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, it comes down to we just didn't have the fear of not being able to figure out how to be a virtual wholesaler. We just implemented solutions across the board. And that's what's enabled us to be where we are today. Love that, man. Uh, I mean, a, a lot of people, um, they get into the game thinking that I have to know how to calculate air, air v, MAO. I have to know how to calculate repairs and I have to know how to do this. But at the end of the day, if you think about this type of uh, business, which is wholesaling, it's, it's a game where you require, in my opinion, two to three different things. Lead generation. So you, if you know how to do lead generation and if you know how to do sales so that that lead generation can be uh, can be taken from uh, someone knocking your door or saying, yes, I'm interested. Let's do business all the way to uh, this position, that property. So you have to know how to do sales, but you also have to have systems in place. Right. So so that you are you're actually having a way that makes sense with with this processes such as you 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 mentioned. Um, and, and is this something you've built out like? It's just something. Tell me about um, about the, the things that you've done to truly take care of those aspects of the business. Yeah, I mean, look, I I spent sixty five thousand dollars on education with one of those hotel seminars that basically told me go buy properties off the MLS and slap them on Craigslist, and that's how you dispo them. Okay, that's that was the education I got for sixty five thousand dollars back in twenty fourteen. Okay, so along the way we had to make a lot of mistakes and, and trial and error to figure out how to get to where we are today. I mean, I, at this point in time, we've, we've done every sort of marketing that you could possibly do, you know, direct mail, 
uh, Facebook ads, PPC, SEO, uh, cold calling, RVMs, you know, SMS. And we've determined, hey, this is our marketing flow now. You know, for us, it's all, it starts with pulling our list inside of batch leads. We skip trace it there. Then we do SMS. Then we do cold calling inside of batch dialer with virtual assistants. And and the, the continuance of that marketing flow would be we would go into RVMs and direct mail. We just, we don't have a need for more leads. So we aren't going past what we're doing with SMS and cold calling outside of, hey, we are also running PPC ads that are inbound leads as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, the, the, this was six, seven years of trial and error and figuring out what was going to work and what wasn't going to work. And and it's not like we just sat down one day. I, I have a, a podcast episode on my podcast called Stop Searching for Unicorns. Uh, <laughs> and, the whole, and the whole point in that is, is uh, there is no unicorn out there. There is no system. There is no s- specific marketing technique that automatically works for somebody, right? It's yes. about what's your manpower, what's your skill set, um, what's your ab- availability to be able to follow up with the seller's and put yourself in the right position. And when you do that, that's when you'll see that next level of success. But yeah, this was not a overnight type of thing. It, it took a lot of work and, and trial and error to figure it out. Love that. I love to touch base on that um, uh, right after this. I want, to, I want to really understand what are you potentially doing really good so that listeners here uh, could potentially be like, hey, look, I'm, I'm, I've been doing this the whole time. Uh, right. wrong or just spinning my wheels why why don't i just go ahead and try what rj bates the third is doing and right. and w- what is making him like being the uh, winner of the closers olympics but i believe uh now we're talking talk ta- we're talking here sales we're talking here closing deals you when you started back when you were a contractor were, were you like that's that type of salesperson like ha- had that been in you or you you started started to, you had to start it whenever you started holds up this business right how how's how's that how did that grow in you yeah i i think there was a point in time where i tried to be more of a salesman and and where i am now and in, in what you'll see if you watch any of my videos where i talk to sellers or in the closers olympics i'm i'm real i'm raw i'm authentic I mean, in the Closers Olympics, I literally tell the seller when she when she comes up with the objection of, hey, I want my husband to look over the contract and I'll sign it later tonight. I literally tell her, I'm in a competition with my buddies right now and I need to get a signed contract in the next 20 minutes. So is there any chance you could go get your husband and look at it now? Two minutes later, she signs the contract. Um, I don't think that the... The problem that I think people run into when it comes to sales and closing, specifically as a wholesaler, is they're trying to play some kind of mental manipulation game where they're trying to convince them to do something instead of just solving their problem, having a real conversation, and literally use the words on how can we make this a win-win situation for both of us. And when you do that, um, I think that's where you see how relaxed I am when I talk to a seller because I know I'm not having to play a game. I know I'm just yeah. talking to them and, and having a real conversation, human to human interaction. And I think that's lost nowadays uh, because there is so much out there about, Hey, this is, I mean, you see some of the books back here on my bookshelf, you know, yeah. you read a book like uh, never split the difference. Uh, yes. Great book, right? Beautiful book written by a former FBI negotiator and, and I think the problem is instead of taking some of the tips in that and making that a tool in your tool belt, we literally try to replicate what he does step by step along the way. And we become robotic in how we're communicating to another human being about selling a piece of property. Like we have to understand that this is something that we do all day, every day. But for the person that we're talking to, more often than not, this might be one of maybe three or four times in their life they're going to sell a property. And we need to just have a little bit of uh, humanity in our voice on, on how we're communicating with them. And when you do that, I think that's where you see the, the, the conversations are a lot smoother and cleaner for us on our end. 
Love that. If you want to see RJ Bates the third in action, you have to get that replay. Uh, but I'm pretty sure here we can actually walk through RJ's uh, uh, RJ's framework on a call. Yeah. Like you understand absolutely that many scenarios can come from motivated sellers. They may yeah. they may have uh, been interrupted by a cold caller. They may have been interrupted by an SMS. They may have seen your direct mail, so they have some sort of intention to reach out to you. They may have gone through your website or seen an ad in PPC or Facebook ads. So walk us through your framework of uh, what really is going to happen whenever you get a person on the phone, uh, like yeah. a motivated seller. Yeah, so for me, it's about efficiency, right? I Look, we're this is a numbers game. We pull a lot of data. We have a lot of incoming PPC leads, so... For me and my team, it's about how quickly can we move through that and identify this is someone that wants to sell their house. So if you listen to my calls, it's it's very quick to, hey, I was calling you about address and are you looking to sell that property? And and that's like how do I open up? And if so, I, I hit them pretty quickly with, well, what were you looking to get for that property? Let's see if we're in the in the ballpark. And I know that is a a uh, complete difference from almost everyone else where they say, Hey, you don't ask about price that early on, right? We got to build some rapport. We got to figure out what their motivation is. We got to identify their pain points. I'm going to do that after I've already identified that they're giving me what I want, right? right. I'm, I'm, I'm having respect for my time. Do you want to sell a house? Uh, how much are you looking to get for it? Cool. Okay. Well, tell me what's going on with it. What's the occupancy on the property? Uh, tell me about the condition. Um, and if, if they're not forthcoming, then we dig a little bit deeper and we ask specific questions, but because we are a virtual wholesaler, I try to limit the amount of information they're going to give us on the condition, uh, because like, look, sellers lie. Okay. Like this, this is a known thing. Sellers aren't going to be forthcoming about everything. So yes. if, if I am very limited on the information that they give me and they say, yeah, it's in good condition, then I'm going to assume it needs a simple cosmetic rehab. Okay. And so at that point in time, I'm not going to dig a whole lot deeper. And, and then we're going to talk about the offer and we dig into it. So if you track my phone calls with a seller, they're going to range somewhere in the, in, in the area of three to four minutes before we're getting to the offer. Um, and that's just based around efficiency, respecting the seller's time. I've noticed yeah. that the longer phone calls go with sellers, uh, there's a, you're opening up yourself to the possibility of them being upset and you not respecting their time. So That's right. there's, there's a lot of thought process into what we do. Um, you know, last year I, I got a lot of uh, credit, but also heat from people that watched me in the Closer Olympics because they said, you know, I was so aggressive and, and it was no, no BS and, and just straight to the point. Well, yes and no. Um, if you, that last call where I actually get the signed contract on the, in the finals at the Closer Olympics, there was plenty of rapport building going on with the seller. You hear me talk about the fact that I was in Cleveland, Ohio for my son's hockey tournament. I talked to her about what she was doing that day, talked to her about her situation. By the end of the conversation, we were laughing and joking and going back and forth. Um, and, and also putting yourself in the position of being the expert on the topic. Okay. Yes. So, she was talking about, right? yes, I was the authority in that conversation because she started off by saying, I have a hundred thousand dollar offer from OfferPad, but they've already hit me with fees to knock down my offer to 96,000. So yeah. the way that I build a rapport and make myself the authority is, is I said, have they come out to do the inspection yet? I have one question. If you answer that question, now I can steer this conversation the way I want it to go. She says, no. I said, well, you know, when they come out to do the inspection, they're going to hit you with the repairs. They're going to probably knock your offer down somewhere in the range of 85 to 90,000. You know that, right? She's like, yeah, I do know that. I said, well, the difference with us is, is we're, I'm willing to give you an offer right now. I'm not going to beat you up on anything else. I just have to walk the property one time. I could offer you $85,000 right now. And she's like, boom, let's do this. This is a safe, secure offer. I know what I'm getting. I don't have to do the rigor more with, with offer pad. So I th look, there's a lot that goes into this, but it's all about being real and authentic and just listening to what the seller's telling you and kind of being fluid within the conversation from that point on.
Yeah, I'm sure you have a training for you and your team uh, that you've gone through or you make them go through in order to understand different scenarios and how to handle different type of situations. Um, is, 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 that, is, that, is, that, is that what you're doing right now with your team? Yeah, I mean, look, we I where I sit in my my office, this is my my podcast station, but I'm out on the floor with the guys um, uh, daily. And and we look, everybody's out there. It's a wide open spot. We can hear all the conversations that are being had. And if there's something that goes on in a conversation, that's great. We'll pause everybody and say, hey, did we see what Justin just did? If something somebody didn't do something right, it's like, hey, this is how I would have steered that conversation a little bit better. Uh, based off of what they're saying. So look, it, again, it's about transparency within our team and and no one's hiding behind a, a wall or a desk or something like that where nobody can hear. It's all out there in the open. So we're we're constantly working to get better as a unit. Love that. There was a debate actually when you mentioned earlier today about um, you going straight for it. I mean, yep. going straight for like asking, uh, so what were you looking to get into it? And because the Slayer judge Steve Trang was uh, had he has a different kind of script or kind of framework or where he extracts try to extract the pain so that they can open up and and then and then he's gonna be able to do, drop the prize because he's gonna match it with the value with the pains. Um, right. So uh, what do you think about that? Like I know that there's different type of closers. I mean there's different styles of closers. The ones that are passive, the ones that are, you know, very a little bit more aggressive, the ones that, you know, know how to match your tone or, you know, a little bit more calm, things like that. So uh, how do, uh, what do you what do you think about that? What do you think about that whole thing? Well, I think Steve and, and Max, obviously, you know, his partner who finished uh, third in, in the Closers Olympics, I think they're they're very powerful at what they do. Um, obviously, they have a great sales training uh, program themselves. I've actually sat in on a couple uh, uh, days of training and listened to, to how they work. It's it's Sandler based uh, closing sales training, right? Um, so there's a lot of the takeaway, the go negative um, things along those lines, and and they're look they're assassins at what they do. Uh, Max was very open and honest about in the closers Olympics. He actually took away uh, parts of his script because of the time constraints. So he actually likes to have much longer conversations, right? So listen, this is a core difference between uh, their business and my business. They are in a market and they like to go deep in that market. I am yes. across the country. And so we like to go wide and I like to siphon deals off of, of the different markets. So if I go to Louisville, Kentucky, my goal in that campaign is to get one to three deals. Yeah. in that campaign okay where they are in phoenix arizona they want to get as many deals as they can possibly get in phoenix arizona so when they are on the phone with the seller they want to find everything out to really dig deep and find that truly like that seller that is hurting and 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 they need a solution and they didn't think there was one out there whereas what we are doing here at titanium is trying to take that low hanging fruit and, and siphon those deals towards us and move on to the next market. So that's just a philosophical difference in our, our company's programs and, and, and game plans. Then, then it, it really has to do with closing. Uh, yeah. That's, that's why I think those, the way we handle those conversations is two totally different yeah. uh, strategies. Love it. Love it. So, so the ones that are non low hanging fruits and of course, let's say they, they feel, uh, they feel like, um, asking for the prize will right. make them control the situation and things like that. Um, what do you do with those? Like, let's say, cause you're going, you know, you're going for those low hanging fruits. What do you do with those? You put them in like follow up type of scenario, or you get them to someone else in your team to follow up with them and talk to them differently. What do you do with those type of people? Well, look, I mean, our goal is, is if we get a, you on the phone, we're making an offer and we're getting an answer right then and there. Um, okay. I I really don't like to, to push leads to a follow-up status uh, because I feel like that's where it gets lost. Like, that's the moment of truth. If we mm -hmm. have them on the phone and they're willing to talk to us right then and there, we need to get a yes or no out of them. And if the answer is yes, we need to get the contract signed. Like, that's what makes you a closer. Otherwise, you're you're wasting your time. You're not respecting your time. You're not respecting the seller's time. 
And that's where you miss out on the opportunities where it's, hey, uh, I didn't sign a contract with you. And so because I took a couple of days to think about your offer, that's where they go and sign with somebody else, right? And so it's my team's job if we're on the phone with them to end it right then and there. We're getting the answer either yes or no. And and that's really where we want to end it. Now, the ones where we have to go deeper and we have to have those long conversations, the goal's the same. It's okay to have a real lengthy conversation if that's where the seller wants it to go. As long as we've identified they're ready to sell and we know that the price range is going to be somewhere within where we need to be, it's okay to have that long conversation. Uh, but we need to at least know that we're not wasting our time because sellers will waste your time to try to look. They're also trying to sell you, right? Let's be real. Yeah. They're actually the ones selling. We're the ones buying. And, and so they'll also try to put the, pull their own sales tactics on you as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, I love that, man. Um, I mean, right now you're doing different type of lead generations and it seems like since you're going virtual, uh, there's a lot of inbound happening. Or yeah. what are what are you currently using for lead generation for this all these virtual markets? So it, everything for us that we do in our office is as a, it starts with market specific SMS. Okay, so what mm-hmm. I'll do is I'll pull a list inside of batch leads for uh, Louisville, Kentucky. We'll use that market because I already said it. Then we'll text that campaign. Once we're done texting that, then we take that all of that data and we put it in the dialer and we cold call it. Okay. Now, after what we'll do is, is I will then pull a nationwide list. And I'm, what I'm doing is, is already all of our skip trace data. And I'll say, I want to hit all of the vacant properties, or I want to hit all of the tax defaults or all the pre foreclosures. And that's a nationwide list. So that's the second way that we hit them. So first market specific, second motivating criteria specific. Okay. Both of those will get hit on the dialer. So they're going to be text twice, cold called twice. And then we also have inbound on PPC uh, where we're running PPC ads and they go to our website and fill out a form saying they would like to sell. And that's run nationwide. Love that. Pretty sure a lot of people, they at the beginning, they really struggle on that cold calling or, you know, just as talking to cold people. Yeah. Um, and and it, it takes um it, it definitely takes some stages to get to to those uh, motivated sellers. But PPC, which is a little bit more expensive, yeah. um, it's another way that people have that have an intention of selling because they go and search in Google to sell a property, to sell their property, sell the property fast. You type in keywords here and there. Right. Um, which, which which channel is the one that's bringing you? Uh, you want to say that's let's say the most the most amount of traffic with motivated sellers. I I think it's a a tie between SMS and PPC. Um, PPC brings in probably more traffic. Uh, SMS probably gives us more contracts. Okay. Yes. And that's, and and, and look, there's a, there's a level of control there. Okay. Uh, SMS is very controlled for us. We're pulling that data. We're, we're navigating the contracts and where we're pulling that PPC nationwide. I mean, look, you're going to get the trailer park that's in the middle of nowhere in Wyoming. I mean, yes. there's there's nothing that you could do with that, <laughs> right? Um, whereas I would never pull that in my own data for SMS and cold calling. Um, and I think the only reason why SMS outperforms cold calling for us is because our marketing flow starts with SMS and then flows to, to cold calling. Um, I think if it was vice versa, cold calling would probably outperform SMS. It's just due to the fact that we choose to do it. And that's because we feel like SMS is more cost effective than cold calling uh, because we're not going to have the guys on the floor cold calling. We we hire virtual assistants to do that. And then they line up appointments for the closers to come in and close. Absolutely. So I've heard um, I've heard and, and I've seen from members and, and other uh, guys running, uh, let's say, cold outbound versus inbound warmer. Let's say PPC, they're able to 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 get deeper discounts. So they, they, they're able to get um, a more a wider spreads uh, because of how the intentions. However, with your sales process, the way that you're trying to do it, I mean, the way that you do it right now, your sales framework, yep. um, are you also noticing that that you're able to get like wider spreads, bigger spreads uh, from 
inbound compared to uh, outbound? Um, I, I wouldn't say that, that that PPC is is that much deeper than anything else uh, because, look, with PPC, you're going to get the people that want full retail as well, right? That's right. Um, and, and then we're living in, in the year of, of wholesale and the hedge funds, right? Yes. I mean, <laughs> that's what everybody's doing, right? Yeah. <laughs> and we're all dispo in the hedge funds. So uh, we're running into situations where, hey, maybe somebody does want pretty close to retail but we know we also have a hedge fund that might pay close to retail, right? So uh, there's times where uh, we're, we're taking down a deal and just making a 10K spread on it because we know we can sell it to the hedge fund for, for a $10,000 spread. Whereas maybe two years ago, that would have never happened. I, I yes. would have been like, we're, we're not we're not buying this deal at 88% of ARV, right? Yeah. Um, and, and how long is that going to survive? You know, that's just yeah. what's happening right now. I mean, at some point in time, the hedge funds are going to do the same thing that Zillow just did, right? Which is yes. going to be like, hey, let's let's pause. This was a bad plan. Like paying 110% <laughs> of ARV, yes. <laughs> right? 110% of ARV is not working out for us. Let's let's pause yes. that. And But, you know, for the time being, let's ride the wave. I would say uh, our spreads are are pretty consistent though across the board across all the channels. I would it, look if I identified there was uh, some kind of marketing channel that was getting us m a much higher spreads. That's the one that we would be diving deeper into. But right now, I would say the only one that I can say that truly gets you much higher spreads is going to be direct mail, um, and I think that will always be the case. Because that is the one that you're going to get a hold of the person that doesn't want to answer the phone, doesn't use the internet. They're the hardest to get a hold of. And, and it's going to take you a ton of money, not just one, not two, but like seven or eight or nine touches via direct mail to get them to finally call you inbound and say, I do want to sell. That's always going to be the one where you get the monster spreads probably more than any other marketing channel. Yes, absolutely. That's so great. And it's interesting that you say about the hedge funds that 2021, 2021 has been kind of like that weird uh, type of year where like, yep. you know, the, the, the you know, the value pro properties of value go up really insanely high. And and then uh, all these hedge funds, of course, start buying heavily into into like close to retail, zero open door offer pad. Um, I'm not sure how long it's going to stay. But uh, I'm pretty sure uh, that people don't even know this and they're not taking advantage of this because not, they're not connected people like you, RJ. Right. Like, I'm pretty sure at some point you've mentioned this a bunch of times. Hey, yeah. hedge fund. Hedge fund right. it is. You know? yeah. uh, and, and even there is other things that are coming, coming out, like such as novation agreement, things like that. But like yeah. being able to, to, to be able to lock up properties in different ways. But um, I mean... Like how much value, like whenever people connect on you on social media, you're, you're a giver, like 30 days, 30 days. I mean, 30, 30 different oh, states. Oh, hold on. Hold on. It, Go for it, it was actually, it was 50 days, 50 days, it was 50, all 50 states in 50 days. So, there you go. Yeah, there you go. My bad. So it was 50 no states, <laughs> 50 states where you went around and 50 days. That is insane. And, and you are showing that in public live like you're showing this live and people are taking it so people have to follow you uh where, where can people fo follow you if 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 they were Look, to the, follow the, you the the two best places are instagram and youtube just search rj Bates the third uh that challenge that i did on on youtube it was literally me going live doing sms and cold calling for eight to 12 hours a day for 53 days straight um, and the only reason why it was 53 days is because there was a couple days where there was technological issues. Uh, we had somebody run into a internet tower right outside our office and it killed the internet for one day, uh, stuff like that. But look, that was a, a great challenge. And I'll be honest with you, man, that's what gave me a lot of confidence going into the closers Olympics. I mean, yeah. you sit there and you do anything for 50 days straight talking to people. It's just like working out for 50 days straight. You're going to get in shape. You're going to feel better about your body. You're going to feel better about what you could do. And that's where I felt. And people ask me, how can I be more like you, RJ? I want to close like you. You got to go out there and put in the reps. Talk to more sellers. And when you get off the phone with a seller, think back and identify what could you have done better or what, could you, what did you do bad in that call and what could you have done better through it. 
and really mentally try to work on that as you progress through your calls over time. And that's where you'll get into a rhythm and you'll know exactly how to have a conversation with a seller. Absolutely. So well, one of the things that I wanted to ask you is, did you even train for this? Or you, it's just like, it's just happening because of so much momentum you've had with sales. You yeah, no, I, no, I, no, I don't. I've never done any sales training. Um, I, 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 I read books, I read audible, listen to audible, uh, but never done a sales training program. And, and as far as training goes, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's every day in my office talking to real sellers. I mean, I, I think that's the difference. I mean, look, as a owner of a business, you're going to be put on the, the limelight in, as an uh, influencer or something like that, where you'll say, Hey, you have this opportunity. I think we saw that with a couple of the guys that competed in the closers Olympics they're not actually closing deals on a regular basis. And so it was kind of like a little uncomfortable sitting in the seat. Uh, but for me, it's like, Hey, this is, this is my passion. Like, this is what I, I'm supposed to do. I enjoy doing it. I enjoy working with the guys and, and, and I just, I love getting on the phone and helping solve people's problems. So it was a, a joy to be a part of. And I, I, I look forward to defending my crown next year. Love that. So in your company, in your company, you are basically taking care of the acquisitions department. Yeah, so I, I pull the list. I set up the, the campaigns for the guys. And then I kind of I'm, I'm overseeing and listening to what's going on as I'm taking care of my day to day. But yeah, I'm, I'm very much in it and, and listening to what's going on. And I'm a I'm a hands on uh, boss. You know, you, you hear other guys talk about the fact that they're living the dream and they, you know, they get the vacation 10 weeks out of the year. Um, I'm enjoying the ride of where I'm at right now. And, and I'm not at the point where I want to delegate everything out. I, I like being here and like riding what we're doing. Love that. And I saw that you have also a discipline queen in your, in your team. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> Cassie, Cassie's my partner and, and look, she, she's the unsung hero, right? I'm the one with the podcast and the YouTube channel. We finally just gave her a little, uh, hour and a half, uh, episode on, on the YouTube channel where she comps properties for people and stuff like that live. Uh, but she's the unsung hero here. You know, she works with the guys just as much as I do. Um, she, she handles a lot of the back end, uh, stuff that really just my visionary mind can't, can't handle. I would, I would lose my mind. And so she does a lot of uh, great things for titanium. She's been with me since day one. So, um, yeah. Talking about visionary man, man, uh, having a partner such as that one, uh, it's huge because it keeps you like, it keeps you like a lot of things like glued together. Yes. Uh, pretty sure people have read here rocket fuel, or if you haven't rocket fuel is somewhere where you understand what's the visionary and what's yeah. an integrator. Yep. Um, and RJ, you are you training your sales team? I, I want I want to talk to to the people that have really uh, maybe a little bit of uh, scaling problems and and they need to either hire a good closer or have a red closers, but don't really know how to truly handle that whole situation. Right. The 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 managing your closers because you're the top level closer there. You know right. how, you build your whole company and uh, you got to keep them aligned and trained and motivated. How, how is that done in a week to week basis, day to day basis? Well, I think first and foremost, make sure you're hiring the right people to fit the, the company culture that you have, right? Not don't hire based off skill sets. Skills can be taught, uh, culture, mindset, things like that cannot. So make sure you're hiring the right people that fit in with your company. Um, second, uh, before you hire, make sure that you have an understanding of what you want that person to be like in that role. And the only way that you can do that is, is by doing it yourself and truly understanding, hey, this is what it's going to be like day to day for this person. This is what it's going to feel like. These are the systems I'm going to give them. This is the process I want them to follow. It. Write it down, make it plain, have it there for them. And then once you put them in that seat, uh, don't abandon them. I think this is like the, the huge issue with entrepreneurs is like, we think for whatever reason, because we hire you and we, we train you for however long um, that you're going to be OK. And, and look, I'm guilty of it myself, you know, just, hey, when was the last time I had a conversation with that guy? Um, and so that's why now I'm back on the floor with the guys like I previously this was my desk and, and there's a there's a wall there. I couldn't hear them. 
And so I had to go back out there and get on the floor with them with another desk just so I could hear the conversations, right? Read their body language, see what their mindset is. Like, dude, there's times where when you're talking to sellers and you get your teeth kicked in for two weeks straight, it's like, hey, I need a little bit of like uh, uplifting uh, motivation here. You know, I need to have a conversation. What am I doing wrong? And, and that's our job as leaders in the organization to have those conversations with them and help them get through those tough times. And that's where you'll see people become loyal to your company and, and really want to stick around. And, and I think that's something that, that Cassie and I pride ourselves on is that the majority of people that we brought on have really stuck with us for a very long time. And, and that's something I'm extremely proud of. I love that, man. And, and really one of the things that entrepreneurs have in their mind is how can I build something and delegate as, as much as possible, as yeah. fast as possible? But it seems like you're really a hands-on person that yeah. truly has is there with your team and, and making them grow, like your yeah. team itself. So do you recommend do you recommend just delegating you know that sales manager, trainer, leader, or, or do you recommend staying? I, how long? How long? How long you recommend uh, being there? I, I look. I think that first and foremost, you need to have some kind of results yourself that you're happy of, right? Before you try to delegate this out to somebody else, um, have an understanding of what that position looks like, what you want them to do, and, and then also the the scaling and the growth should be an organic thing, like not just one day you wake up and decide, hey, I'm going to scale. Like it should be, hey, let's bring in acquisitions manager in. Let's train them. Let's make sure that person succeeds before we try to bring in five acquisitions guys. Because look, you're you're messing with people's lives. Like this is important for not only your business, but also for the people that you're bringing in. Make sure that they're able to succeed. That's your job as a leader. And I think it's very important to just, sometimes you could go a lot faster by slowing down. And, and that's, it's, it's important for entrepreneurs because look, we live in a, in a day and age where Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, all of these, what are they telling you? They're telling you everybody else's wins. They're telling you how everybody else is succeeding wildly. And if comparison is the thief of joy, if you sit there and you think that that's a reality, you're never going to be happy with yourself. So at some point in time, you have to realize that's just what's being put on social media. I'm running my own path and this is the path that I'm going to do it. And it's going to be a slow organic growth. When you do that, that's where you'll really see those leaps and bound uh, growth moments. Huge, huge. Like you said, sometimes, if, you know, fastest way you can go is slower. Yep. And that's, 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 that's huge, man. Um, how many, how many deals you, you, you're currently moving? If you don't mind me asking. Uh, last month we had 96 deals on the board. So, um, we're, we're going to have, uh, a, a pretty significant, uh, increase of deal flow this year because we've also grown the team. So, uh, last year we, to do the 50 day challenge. Okay. Uh, we had eliminated everybody in our company or they had eliminated themselves. So we went down to where it was just myself, Cassie and, and my other partner, Elijah Del Garza. So it was the three of us. I did the 50 day challenge. We brought on Keaton. We eventually brought on Patrick, and now we've got a, a, a team of close to 17 people on the floor, and, and the deal flow has consistently gone from, hey, we're doing about 10 deals to 20 to 40 to 60 to 90. Um, right now, I think we have somewhere in the range of 70 deals on the board, either uh, acquired in, in recon, dispo, or assigned. So it, it's, a, it's a pretty consistent flow at that range. Um, with a, right around 15, 17 people. And that includes virtual assistants as well. Love that. And you you obviously, man, have built a multi, multi-million dollar company. And you yes. obviously have gone through uh, that hurdle of really doing something you didn't want, which it was being a contractor, being all the, doing all this handiwork and going to building an actual business that cash flows. Um, so so tell, tell me, like, uh, what do you, what do you think that people that are doing right now five seven deals a month and but they're, that they're stuck and they feel that they're stuck and can't scale what what do you feel is a is the things that what is the approach 
that they should be doing in order to truly like break out, out of that? Well, I think it, yeah, I break this down. This is like the, the beginning of, of my uh, two day education boot camp. Okay. So this is, this is what, how I start the whole program. First and foremost, uh, decide what your hedgehog concept is going to be. Okay. That's straight from Jim Collins. Good to great book. Um, this is what this means is, is are you going to be the wholesaler that, go, that goes deep in a market? Or are you going to be a nationwide virtual wholesaler? Are you going to flip houses? Are you going to be a landlord? Are you going to owner finance? What are you going to be? Decide what that is. That's step one. Okay. Step two is stop searching for unicorns. Decide what your systems are going to be. So for us, our systems are batch leads, Propelio, prop stream, and then our CRM and batch dialer. Okay. That those are the systems that we use. Okay. So now I don't have to pay attention to any of the Facebook posts or anything else that tells me, oh, here's the new greatest thing of all time. Nope, that's shiny object syndrome. I forget about those. Now focus your habits. So focus your habits are your processes. The, the things that you do on a daily basis that how you use those systems. So how do I use batch leads? How do I use prop stream? How do I use Propelio? How do I use batch dialer? And then but make those become habits. Everybody in the company knows how to do everything the exact same way. And then you become consistent as a tree. Well, there's nothing in this world more consistent than a tree. Okay. You don't even see it growing. It goes from a little twig in the ground to this huge monstrous thing, right? That's what your business should be because it's consistently growing, not overnight. A twig, a tree does not go from this to a hundred feet tall. It just one day is a hundred feet tall and you don't even know how it happened. So that's what you need to be showing up every day, making sure you're focused on your hedgehog concept, but making sure your systems are being used appropriately around your habits. And then that's why our phrase right here, whoop, create your own reality that when you do those, that's how you create your own reality. That's, that's our whole, whole program right there. Love that, man. So, so how can people find out more about, you know, being, being mentored by you, being seeing the ropes by you, uh, kind of going past that five, seven deals, or even one to three deals. How how can people find more about that? Yeah, our our website's titaniumcrucible.com. Um, and and it's a two day boot camp here at our office in Fort Worth, Texas. We bring you in, and look, it, I think this is also very important for people to understand. Okay. You need to understand what it is that you really want to accomplish, right? Sometimes people say they want to do more than five to seven deals a month, and then they get to 15 deals a month, and they're not happy about it. You need to understand why it is that you want to do, what is your objective when wanting to do more, right? Um, because I'll be honest with you, there is a purgatory as an, an, a, an entrepreneur where you go past a certain um, uh, revenue amount and it's really hard to decide how many people you need, who's doing what task. Really sit down and write down your vision for what you want your business to be and why you want it to be that. Um, I think that's something that people don't talk about enough in this, in this business, in this industry. Um, because look, Five to seven deals a month, there's nothing wrong with that. You're probably making pretty decent money, you know? So sit down and think about that because I'm assuming if you're doing five to seven deals a month, um, at some point in time, uh, you were making such low amount of money that if you had thought about doing five to seven deals a month, uh, you probably would have cried yourself. So just think about that when you think about trying to scale. 100%. And I think that when people try to scale, ultimately, they, they're just trying to free up a little bit more of their time. Yep. Uh, because a lot of people, they find themselves doing this and working the whole time. But but really, they're not a hustler at you or me. They're not right. really a huge hustler, like hands on kind of person. And, and, and they really need to develop systems and develop this scalable business um, yep. so it's, it's something you have to really understand that this is going to be hard um this is not just uh, sunshine and rainbows and titanium shows you you know right right uh so titanium is all about that rusty i mean you know that metallic kind of thing tell me more yeah. about that that ti ti titanium show um, yeah 
Tell so it, yeah, it's, it's kind of a cool story. So we were trying to think of what our business name was going to be. Right. And, uh, we kept coming up with names. We were like integrity investments. Uh, we came up with Titan investments and then it, and then I can't remember who said it. somebody said titanium investments and we looked it up and, and it was the 22nd element on the periodic table of elements. Okay. Now my number in all sports growing up was 22. Uh-huh. Cassie, my partner was born on February, the second month, 22nd. So two twenty two. So her number was always 22 and we looked it up in the state of Texas and it was available. Titanium investments was available. So man, uh, now we, we got these everywhere we go. Um, it, it's become who we are. Um, I never thought that at some point in time in my life, I'd be walking around with shirts and hats with a metal, like titanium all over it, but it's literally become <laughs> a, 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 who we are, you know, and, and that's what a brand's supposed to be, you know? And so our crucible that we have, the two day boot camp, a crucible is where you put uh, metal into and you literally melt it down and you get all the impurities off of it and then it comes out pure. And so that's what that's what how they make this right here, right? This goes through a crucible and it comes out pure titanium in this cube. And so this is what we give out to all of our attendees after attending the two days. Okay, you went through and we took out all your impurities and now you're pure titanium. And so it's uh, it's been a cool little thing for our brand, and uh, I, I never thought that it would it would turn out that way. But I'm I'm glad that uh, it became a part of who we are. Love that. I always tell my audience and the audience people that are listening that I'm gonna bring diamond type of players, but you you're taking it to that titanium, titanium <laughs> level. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome, love it. man. Oh man, it was it was so good um, listening to you. I, I want to have a real uh, second deep conversation with you in another episode maybe we can go on nitty-gritty about just skill set of the sales you know just yeah. sell the, the sales itself like maybe maybe we can walk through uh your script or maybe we can do a role play or whatever that'll be huge for people to really listen yeah. and understand uh so man um is there anything that you like to tell the listeners uh before we close this uh, show for today. Yeah, I, I think right now, obviously, with the, the wave of people that have watched the Closers Olympics and stuff like that, you know, there's a lot of people that now know who I am that maybe previously didn't. Look, if that, for whatever reason, resonated with you, I want you to understand that all I did was I was myself. And I don't want you to go out there and try to be me. I want you to go out there and be yourself as well. Um, that's where I think people sometimes mess up and they try to have conversations the exact same way as me, um, where you're missing the, the core to what makes me successful when I talk to sellers, which is I'm just talking to them like I talk to anybody else. And the analogy that I use there is, is I'm talking to a seller the same way I would talk to a waiter when I walk into a restaurant and I say I want a hamburger it's the same thing for you. You're just talking to a homeowner and you're saying, I want to buy your house, have a real conversation, just be a human being and, and you'll be successful. Wait, wait, wait. So, so your, your wife, do you go and walk to her and say, I want to marry you? <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, hey, I want to take I, you on I, a date. <laughs> yeah. I mean, honestly, you just, you be real like that. And listen, nowadays it's so uncommon for people to be real and do that, that people respect it. It'll be yeah. one of two things. They'll either be highly offended because you weren't fake with them or they'll love you because you were real with them. Which one would you rather be? Um, I, I personally just like to have, I don't want to have to worry about being somebody else. I just like being me and, and having conversations. Love that, man. Being you, just really reflecting yourself in inside social media as you and outside of social media as you. That's one Absolutely. thing that, that people, if you want to build a brand like the brand that RG has been doing, if you watch him, he pulls jokes here and there, man. Like yep. it's so funny the things that he posts. Uh, you uh, you should definitely follow him on uh, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, I love that, man. <laughs> but, but again, it's just me being me, right? Yeah. I mean, it, uh, dude, I love humor. Humor is one of the greatest things ever of all time, and and to be able to do it. Look, I love all the guys that compete at the Closers Olympics and all that. 
But if I can't make fun of you and, and you get offended by it, it's like, look, man, we're probably not meant to be friends because I make fun of everybody, including myself. So I, I'm, I'm not uh, easy on myself either. I'll make fun of myself as well. But look, I, I think people will love that, you know, just uh, having a good time. I, I love walking around with just a smile on my face. Yeah, you know, man, it's it's just it actually works in your freaking muscles. Like you feel it, like it's freaking yeah. amazing. Yes. Love that. Everyone that is watching this, I just want to ask you for two things. One, to share this to with your people, uh, share with your community, share with your circle, share it with friends. Uh, just share in social media this episode, whether you're listening in pod in Spotify, Audible, Apple Podcast, iHeart, YouTube, whatever it is that you're uh, listening, just share it. Leave a review if you love this. Uh, go and follow RJ Bates the third. Uh, you know you have RJ Bates the third on Instagram. And if you're really looking to uh, to truly truly change the way that you think in your business in your real estate investing wholesaling business, uh, go and and try to try to do the the metallic titanium crucible type of way. All right, uh, how do how, am I pronouncing it right? crucible 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 there you go crucible uh and uh yeah that's everything i'm asking for you guys i hope that you enjoyed the show uh don't forget to like and subscribe you're in youtube and uh have a good one take care